Aloha and welcome to the Matrix of Peace show hosted by Think Tech Hawaii. I'm your host, Phyllis Bleece, and CEO of Peace Through Commerce. Our guest today is Nilima Bhatt, the Distinguished Professor in Gender and Conscious Leadership with Technology de Monterrey, Mexico. She is also the founder of Shakti Leadership Mission. We are discussing part one of the show entitled, I want to get this right, uh, Terror, Violence, and the Impulse to Destroy, which Nilima will address with the transformational path and practice of Shakti leadership. Aloha, Nilima. Namaste, Phyllis. Thank you for having me on the show. Oh, you're so welcome. And we we have a lot to cover, this ergo, this is part one. And I, just to begin with, since we're going to address the problem of terror, violence, and destruction with Shakti leadership, could you tell us what it is and uh, how we could learn more about it? Shakti leadership is a book I wrote with my co-author, Professor Raj Sisodia. We were looking to offer the world a leadership model that is for conscious leaders that works for all genders, not just for men, um, and also for all peoples from around the world, all cultures. So that's uh, Shakti leadership. We talk about true power because leadership is an exercise of power to get things done. So if you want to be a conscious leader, you want to exercise conscious power to get conscious outcomes. And that conscious power, the true power, where you do power with rather than power over each other, that is from the Indic knowledge system called Shakti, that there is an infinite universe and it's infinitely creative and there's power for all because it's a creative power out of which we are created, sustained and um, transformed. So how to know what is our Shakti and how to access our Shakti uh, makes us Shakti leaders. All right. And just so the audience knows, I am certified Shakti leader graduate from your program. And what I learned is that it is also uh, a follow on practice from integral yoga. And I wonder if you could. So we all know a little bit about yoga. Is your background in yoga uh, in integral philosophy or integral theory? Could you speak a little bit to how you entered this world? Yes, so I certified as a yoga teacher and uh, my relationship, uh, well, the current uh, philosophical ground from which I work is the integral yoga of uh, Sri Aurobindo and the mother, okay. uh, who are my okay. masters. Okay, good. Because like, we had a picture of you as a yoga, as a yoga, your own yoga group. Uh, maybe Mike could show that. And you, we, we kind of covered that in slide. I think, Mike, and you created this. So this is you as a yoga and yogini? or Yes. Yes. And you got started with this at this level of your life. So you're in your teens or early 20s? Yeah. So um, I my life with yoga and, and Shakti began, who knows, you know, before you can even join the dots, it goes back a very, very long way. When I was just a child, my father was a naval officer and he got posted to Germany to build a ship for the Indian Navy, an oil tanker. And the ship was called INS, Indian Naval Ship, Shakti. Uh -huh. So my, my life with Shakti began very early. And then I joined Philips uh, as you know, head of corporate communications, the, the multinational Dutch company. And then I had to make a presentation of uh, in the Indian company to the global board of Philips. And the, the, the theme of that was Shakti, the power of India. And then a few years later, when we'd moved to Hong Kong, I started a dance company with a group of um, other Indian classical dancers. And that dance company was called Sri Shakti. And then, and then years later, of course, my, by now, my, my life with yoga in earnest had begun. And the uh, integral yoga of Sri Aurobindo and the mother, which basically says all life is yoga. And uh, finally, you know, our transformation doesn't come from our personal effort so much as the in this, this great power of the universe, which takes us over that we should be able to give ourselves to. 
and that is Shakti, the great mother, the great creative principle, right? So um, integral yoga would say, take Shakti and surrender yourself to your Shakti and then let Shakti lead your yoga and, you know, create a divine life out of a divine body. And um, so, yeah, it's a long, long journey, but that's what it is in a nutshell. But uh, bringing Shakti to leadership is uh, is kind of a, a very powerful uh, thought, which I want the world to receive and work with, because all leadership is the exercise of power. And typically we've been playing all kinds of power over, uh, you know, win-lose games. And my premise is that there's enough power for all. So the only win is a win-win. And uh, if we learn how to tap into our Shakti, there's enough for all. There's enough power for all. So as I hear you, we're talking about archetypal uh, entities and powers, Shakti and Shiva. And then you started to talk about Sri Aurobindo and the mother. And so they're more modern, 1920s through 50s, 60s. And 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 are they so? Are do they hold uh, a thesis and philosophy around integral yoga that feeds into where we're going today and learning about Shakti leadership? Who are they? Yeah, so they are among India's great masters. Sri Aurobindo was a freedom fighter, but more than that, he was an enlightened master. He was a real uh, rishi, a great yogi, and his spiritual partner was Mira Alfasa. Uh, who came from France. She was born in France, but her mother was Egyptian. Her father was Turkish, and uh, she was actually Jewish by birth. Mm. But uh, when the two of them came together as spiritual masters, they were working for the um, transformation of the body, for the evolution of consciousness on this planet. And all that required, um, you know, in a way, the end of the world wars, uh, understanding that there were all kinds of transpersonal archetypal forces that were anti-evolution and uh, the only way to move through them and the forces that were allowing world wars on this planet the only way to work through them was the path and practice of an integral yoga which is you understand what are the forces that drive you and then learn how to master them or learn how to work with a power even greater than them so that they no longer control you so that is integral yoga and you just set up for us the two pillars of the of our talk today. You talked about war yes. that wants to interfere with consciousness and yes. presencing, and then consciousness and presencing and the elements of Shakti leadership. So yes. let's start with the with the shadow side and bring up a slide about a book that formed the basis for the title of the show today, which I wanted to get right. So title violence and the impulse to destroy this is where it feels like we are today with the wars around the world none not the least of which began in most recently in ukraine and now are showing up in in um israel gaza and into the red sea uh along the sinai as well so talk to us now about how, what brought you to this and i know we can read the book uh, talk to us about this, please. Yeah. So uh, even before Ukraine and uh, Israel and Gaza, uh, this book came out in 2016, Shakti Leadership. And sometime in 2012, there were these spate of rapes in India that made global headlines. Oh. And uh, I remember being very, very concerned, saying, what is it in human nature? that leads to such incredible capacity for misogyny, for violence, for not just killing, but brutally killing in a very perverse way. You know, what is the perversion in human nature? And when I started looking up the psychology of violence and trying to understand what are the roots of the violence that we are capable of, I came across this book, Terror, Violence, and the Impulse to Destroy, by uh, Jungians who called a conference after 9-11 because they were in search to understand what is the psychology of violence that lets people, you know, do the kind of, that kind of uh, uh, an act. So mm -hmm. I was deeply impressed and uh, the insights I got from that then informed my understanding of misogyny as well, right? 
So understanding our inner nature and the origin of a psychology of violence and terror, basically saying that we are made up of these four drives. You know, we may think we are very uh, conscious beings, that we are thinking creatures, we are no longer animals. But actually, what the Jungians know well, and this comes from many other ancient uh, traditions and understanding, that we are made up of two selves at a minimum. We are made up of a somatic self, which is our body. And our body has two drives. It has eros, which is the life drive. And it also has thanatos, which is the death drive. So we have this from our animal nature, from our animal evolution, right? Mm. That to procreate, you need eros. Uh, when, you know, when you see um, a male mount a female out in nature, you think it's perfectly fine because that's just laws of nature working out. or when you see a tiger run after a deer and attack it and kill it with with just pure you know thanatos because it needs to feed itself there is that death instinct as well right so okay, we're the, showing that so you've got two of your four drives here on the horizontal axis yes okay. yes and in the uh, indic tradition they are called kama and mara right so kama is the eros and mara is the death right so in Buddhism as well, they talk about how Buddha had to overcome the threefold fire in order to achieve his Buddhahood, you know, Kama Mara. And the next is actually the other axis that as humans, we are also churned by two more drives which come out of our mental nature. So mm -hmm. when mind appears in evolution in the human, it's the first time that you have two new drives on the scene in evolution. You have the Logos, which is the left brain, which is the rational self, but you also have mythos, which is the right brain, the intuitive, imaginative, creative, circular self, right? The linear versus right. thinking in a circular way. So suddenly you have in nature a creature which is human, which is churned by four drives. Each has its own powerful instinct. That's why they're called drives. They drive us. So you know, so the Buddha, with his Buddha, which is like the Logos nature, had to overcome Maya, which is the imaginative uh, mythic self, right? So in Buddhism, they would say Buddha had to overcome Kama, Mara, Maya. Whereas in the Jungians, they were saying, you know, the Logos has to learn how to be in control of Eros, Thanatos, and, and a Mythos, right? So right. Um, here we are on the evolutionary ladder. As a species, this is our job. This is how we we earn our our particular niche in evolution, and to be able to hold it in a way that is harmonized and reconciled. Now, the thing is, our mind and our, we haven't yet mastered ourselves sufficiently to have mastered our drives, right? And this is this is what's at work. So, you know, these four drives drive us the self, and the Jungians call it the fourfold self. And um, what Carl Jung says, inside each of us, these opposites come together in conjunction, right? They either confront one another in enmity or they attract one another in love. So these are archetypal polarities inside us, eros, thanatos, logos, mythos, and they are kind of at each other. And this is our inner churn, our inner battle that is seeking harmony, that is seeking to be harmonized. And then you understand that our conflicting inner drives lead to our outer wars, right? That's Unless so. we understand and reconcile our innate human drives, we cannot create lasting global harmony because that which is within is what is expressed on the outside. So so in, in, in some of my circles, we've there was a teacher in leadership talking about the crocodile brain or the croc brain. And he said this small down at the base of our neck. And he said, we are programmed when we come up with a new situation to either kill it, eat it, or mate with it. Yes. And that's a very basic way, you know, you had, and just, just to slow it down a little, we talk about logos or the word. This is, this is both their Latin and Greek derivations of the, of the logos. And then the mythos or mythology to get it into to the English. And yes. then you've got you've got the, what is what is powerful is that we have the yoga integral 
Buddhist traditions, and they're all identifying these same drives. So I yes. you you're definitely, I feel like you're focusing us clearly mainlining on the most important drives that we need to to navigate and be in charge of there's they don't drive us uh so that we don't look like these russian soldiers in the next slide what's going on here so that's what i'm saying right that our conflicting inner drives lead to our outer wars and therefore my subtitle to today's show is global peace through inner peace or mm -hmm. global harmony through inner harmony. Until we harmonize one life at a time, these four drives that drive us around our anchoring center, our presence, until we do that and, and until we learn how to alchemize these four drives into something that is a higher expression of each of them, uh, we will continue to act them out in the world and you will have the wars in the world because right. the macrocosm is nothing but a reflection of the microcosm. Well, right? and, I, and I just have to say, all of this drama and all of this driving can be going on unconsciously until we name it and then claim it. Very human of us to need to name it before we can even see it. So you've named it yes. and you call it out. And now you're taking us on both a path and a practice to navigate it, manage it, evolve it, tra transform it. Uh, with love, right? Yes. With consciousness, with yes. ag with agency to take back the age. And you think, and definitely, your Shakti leadership methodology does give us agency. Uh, and and what else is going into this practice and path? So uh, let me show you. I've been fascinated. Everything I teach, I first have worked on myself, and my life has been the perfect laboratory to to really work these things out. So I was deeply attracted to the idea of alchemy that Jung, Jung worked very hard on as well. And his book, Mysterium Kanyankshanis, right? He says, an inquiry, that's the next slide, an yeah. inquiry into the separation and synthesis of psychic opposites in alchemy, right? The transformation of our nature into something higher, purer, more fully divine. And then he says, often the polarity is arranged as a quaternio, a quaternity with the two opposites crossing one another. So if you go to the next slide, this is the fourfold self that uh, but becomes the fourfold Shakti that Sri Aurobindo talks about and mm -hmm. that the Jungians talk about as the four mature archetypes in leadership, right? So there is a book by Sri Aurobindo on the mother Shakti, the, that power, which has four aspects. There is harmony, which maps onto the Lover, and this comes from the book King, Warrior, Magician, and Lover by Robert Moore and Douglas Gillette. And then you have Warrior, which maps on to Strength. The, so Harmony is the Maha Lakshmi energy. Strength is the Maha Kali archetype. Then Wisdom is the Maheshwari archetype, and that represents the sovereign king or queen. And Perfection is the Magician archetype, the Maha Saraswati uh, energy in 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 integral yoga. So there are these four sh fold shakti. There there are four powers of the mother, the shakti that represent wisdom, strength, harmony, and perfection, and they map onto the four mature uh, archetypes of leaders as sovereign, lover, warrior, magician. And if we can actually play from these archetypes, then they are the same lower drives that are transmuted and expressed as necessary energy and power needed in leadership. So I just want to point out to the audience that this overlay didn't happen automatically. This is your gift, Neelima. You, yes. are, <laughs> you are doing the heavy lifting of bringing in together wisdom traditions that in support each other and and reinforce each other and then you were just talking about the lower drives and and just to finish out my little brain scenario what i was taught is it's very hard for we human beings to get past this crock brain and get up into our frontal cortex so that we can think and transcend our instincts or those drives and so hold that thought, because yes, right yes. there is our it's, next slide. The next yes. slide. 
which talks about the four conscious leadership qualities that can turn our drives into our power bases, right? So yeah. I'm showing you a beautiful color wheel. And this is the, the logo, the symbol of the mother of uh, Sri Aurobindo um, Ashram and, you know, the teacher from whom I feel inspired and from whom yeah. I actually feel I'm receiving and channeling all this, uh, this, this understanding. So she's basically saying, look, this is the symbol and the symbol captures the 12 qualities. If you see in the outer circle, if we can simply practice, okay, getting to wisdom, strength, harmony, perfection is like trying to become God, goddess, right? Which we right. can't. But right. as humans, the outer wheel, the outer petals, the 12 on the outside, those we can. Those are very human uh, endeavors and cap capacities that can be practiced. So so just because they're so important, it, if you just walk us through it, read it for those only listening. So they're, yes. these are attainable. These are values. Yes. Yes. These are 12 conscious leadership values or qualities. Sincerity, humility, gratitude, perseverance, aspiration for the divine, receptivity to the grace, progress, courage, goodness, generosity, equality of mind, which is like an equanimity towards things, and peace. Mm. Mm. And then we get to the four inner virtues. It's actually, it's very simple. I, my understanding is, if we can simply practice those 12 qualities, take one quality a month. We are in January now. Okay, yeah. this month, if I only practice my sincerity, as a leader, I catch myself when I do self-deception and I remember to keep applying sincerity in every situation. February, let me work with humility. Just, just practice humility. You know, just whatever the situation, apply the superpower of humility and see how that works for you. March, let's go with gratitude. Whatever happens, can I find something to be grateful for? Make that a practice, right? right? So, and, I, and I want to... And I want to, unless you get more, I want to get, I want to, before we're out of time in five minutes, I wanted to uh, uh, take a moment. I don't think we've covered in the show yet. And if I may, I'll just state it because I want to make sure it gets said that Shakti is this uh, power in the world. And Shiva represents the, it, it, not wisdom, but consciousness. consciousness. And you've taught me that consciousness without power is flat, um, is powerless. Uh, sterile. Sterile. That's the word I was going for. Because there is a sexual, there is this, the, the, the sexes that we're going to get to in the next slide. So it's sterile without the power. And power without consciousness is chaos. And yes. then you bring, so, so that's just these Shakti Shiva powers. We want both. Yes. And, and, and to, to bring them both into uh, union, we can step into our frontal cortex and have a marriage with our basic instincts and drives yes. and become one happy family. Provided we know how to presence them and exercise them consciously. This is what this wheel is showing you. It's saying you don't have to try and work at your drives directly, that they're too difficult. They're archetypal. You can't control drives. But what you can do is work on your nature, work on becoming sincere, humble, grateful, have perseverance, aspiration, receptivity, progress, courage, goodness, generosity, equality, peace. If you simply put in the work there, very naturally, your drives will reveal and express as wisdom, strength, harmony, and perfection. Okay. So I, we have a payoff. For getting this far, your last your last two teachings and uh, which position us for our show in two weeks, part two. But bring us to where are we going when we do navigate and get into this balance? Yeah. So let's move to the next slide. Finally, where we are getting to is called the inner wedding, the dance of love and power, where you're basically Shiva and Shakti aren't two. They are one. But yeah. when it's expressed as consciousness, it's Shiva. And when it's expressed as uh, energy and creativity, it is Shakti, right? So when mm -hmm. we are saying be a Shakti leader, we're saying you have to achieve that inner wedding of 
power, which is Shakti, and love, which is that magnetic principle of Shiva that keeps Shakti in in its true and pure uh, expression, right? So you got to get your heartful man married to your mindful woman. This is the next level of chunk, your masculine, feminine tendencies that are in all of us. Eros and Thanatos, would, someone would say Thanatos is more masculine, Eros is more feminine. Even Logos and Mythos, right? There is a way of saying one has a more active energy, one has a more receptive energy. So for the first level of psychological integration, it looks like this. It looks like the, the Tao, you know, your heartful man gets married to your mindful woman. And then you move to the quaternity. The psychological wholeness comes from becoming that holy family reunion. This is the next slide, where your parent self and your child self are organized around your center, your presence, and your inner woman, your feminine side, and your inner man, the, the one is the anima, the other one, the animus. They are two, they too are organized around your presence and your center. They are integrated. They are held by that centering axis in you. And we say you have to become the wise fool of tough love. Now, this is something Shakti leadership offers the world, saying you want to understand what is psychological wholeness. It's very simple. You have to become the wise fool of tough love. Wise is the parent self. Fool is that curious, wondrous inner child. You know, tough is the masculine and love is the feminine. And the human inner experience of Eros, Thanatos, Logos, and Mythos has long been a veritable battlefield, a Kurukshetra of a war between masculine and feminine for supremacy over the other, tragically cancelling and destroying each other. But it's time to end the battle of the sexes and become fully human and be leaders who are conscious, meaning they show self-mastery and selfless service of a higher purpose, and they're integrated. They express mature masculine and feminine values and behaviors using the, the, the 12 qualities of the mother. And that's why oh. we say it's time to become the Ardha Narishwar. And this is that picture the where last, you say- The last slide? That, yes, the last slide, where that yes. inner harmony, where the right side is Shiva, the left side is Shakti, but they are one and the same being. And this iconography, is called the Ardha Narishwar, the half male, half female God. So we are all equal parts masculine and feminine, and that is what psychological wholeness is about archetypally. That is so wholesome, Nilima. Thank you for in giving us the, the, a fast 101 on this important uh, path and practice of Shakti leadership. And we're going to have to leave it there. On January 17th at 12 noon Hawaii time, we will be revisiting part two and taking the seeds that we can all become with Shakti leadership practices and apply that knowledge base to the matrix of peace, whole systems model of society, which provides the soil in which the seeds are safe to grow. And with, we'll have to leave it there. You have been watching the Matrix of Peace show at Think Tech Hawaii. I'm your host, Phyllis Bleece. We've been discussing the topic of terror, violence, and the impulse to destroy, which Nilima has addressed with the transformational path and practice of Shakti leadership. And Nilima is the co-founder of the Shakti Leadership Mission. Mahalo, Nilima. I'm your host, Phyllis Bleece. We'll be back January 17th for part two. And with that, I will leave you all with aloha.